The Truth About Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bree. What's Wrong with the World by G.K. Chesterton. Part 4, Chapter 4 The Truth About Education. When a man is asked to write down what he really thinks on education, a certain gravity grips and stiffens his soul, which might be mistaken by the superficial for disgust. If it be really true that men sickened of sacred words and wearied of theology, if this largely unreasoning irritation against dogma did arise out of some ridiculous excess of such things among priests in the past, then I fancy we must be laying up a fine crop of cunt for our descendants to grow tired of. Probably the word education will some day seem honestly as old and objectless as the word justification now seems in a Puritan folio. Gibbon thought it frightfully funny that people should have fought about the difference between the homoousian and the homoousian. The time will come when somebody will laugh louder to think that men thundered against sectarian education and also against secular education. That men of prominence and position actually denounced the schools for teaching a creed and also for not teaching a faith. The two Greek words in Gibbon look rather alike but they really mean quite different things. Faith and creed do not look alike, but they mean exactly the same thing. Creed happens to be the Latin for faith. Now having read numberless newspaper articles on education, and even written a good many of them, and having heard deafening and indeterminate discussion going on all around me almost ever since I was born, about whether religion was part of education, about whether hygiene was an essential of education, about whether militarism was inconsistent with true education, I naturally pondered much on this recurring substantive. And I am ashamed to say that it was comparatively late in life that I saw the main fact about it. Of course, the main fact about education is that there is no such thing. It does not exist as theology or soldiering exist. Theology is a word like geology. Soldiering is a word like soldering. These sciences may be healthy or not as hobbies, but they deal with stone and kettles, with definite things. But education is not a word like geology or kettles. Education is a word like transmission or inheritance. It is not an object, but a method. It must mean the conveying of certain facts, views, or qualities to the last baby born. They might be the most trivial facts, or the most preposterous views, or the most offensive qualities, but if they are handed on from one generation to another, they are education. Education is not a thing like theology. It is not an inferior or superior thing. It is not a thing in the same category of terms. Theology and education are to each other like a love letter to the general post office. Mr. Fagin was quite as educational as Dr. Strong, and practiced probably more educational. It is giving something, perhaps poison. Education is tradition, and tradition, as its name implies, can be treason. This first truth is frankly banal, but it is so perpetually ignored in our political prosing that it must be made plain. A little boy in a little house, son of a little tradesman, is taught to eat his breakfast, to take his medicine, to love his country, to say his prayers, and to wear his Sunday clothes. Obviously, Fagin, if he found such a boy, would teach him to drink gin, to lie, to betray his country, to blaspheme, and to wear false whiskers. But so also Mr. Salt, the vegetarian, would abolish the boy's breakfast, Mrs. Eddy would throw away his medicine, Count Tolstoy would rebuke him for loving his country, Mr. Blatchford would stop his prayers, and Mr. Edward Carpenter would theoretically denounce Sunday clothes, and perhaps all clothes. I do not defend any of these advanced views, not even Fagin's, but I do ask between the lot of them, has become of the abstract entity called education. 
It is not, as commonly supposed, that a tradesman teaches education plus Christianity. Mr. Salt, education plus vegetarianism. Fagin, education plus crime. The truth is that there is nothing in common at all between these teachers, except that they teach. In short, the only thing they share is the one thing they profess to dislike, the general idea of authority. It is quaint that people talk of separating dogma from education. Dogma is actually the only thing that cannot be separated from education. It is education. A teacher who is not dogmatic is simply a teacher who is not teaching. End of the truth about education. Recording by Breathe, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Breathe. What's Wrong with the World by G.K. Chesterton. An Evil Cry. The fashionable fallacy is that, by education, we can give people something that we have not got. To hear people talk, one would think it was some sort of magic chemistry by which, out of a laborious hodgepodge of hygienic meals, baths, breathing exercises, fresh air, and free hand drawing, we can produce something splendid by accident. We can create what we cannot conceive. These pages have, of course, no other general purpose than to point out that we cannot create anything good until we have conceived it. It is odd that these people, who in the matter of heredity are so suddenly attached to the law, in the matter of environment seem almost to believe in miracle. They insist that nothing but what was in the bodies of the parents can go to make the bodies of the children. But they seem somehow to think that things can get into the heads of children which were not in the heads of the parents or indeed anywhere else. There has arisen in this connection a foolish and wicked cry typical of the confusion. I mean the cry, save the children. It is, of course, part of that modern morbidity that insists on treating the state, which is the home of man, as a sort of desperate expedient in time of panic. This terrified opportunism is also the origin of the socialist and other schemes just as they would collect and share all the food as men do in a famine, so they would divide the children from their fathers as men do in a shipwreck. That a human community might conceivably not be in a condition of famine or shipwreck never seems to cross their minds. This cry of save the children has in it the hateful implication that it is impossible to save the fathers, in other words, that many millions of grown-up, sane, responsible, and self-supporting Europeans are to be treated as dirt or debris and swept away out of the discussion, called dipsomaniacs because they drink in public houses instead of private houses, called unemployables because nobody knows how to get them work, called dullards if they still adhere to conventions, and called loafers if they still love liberty. Now, I am concerned, first and last, to maintain that unless you can save the fathers, you cannot save the children, that at present we cannot save others, for we cannot save ourselves. We cannot teach citizenship if we are not citizens. We cannot free others if we have forgotten the appetite of freedom. Education is only truth in a state of transmission. And how can we pass on truth if it has never come into our hand? Thus we find that education is of all the cases the clearest for our general purpose. It is vain to save children, for they cannot remain children. By hypothesis, we are teaching them to be men. And how can it be so simple to teach an ideal manhood to others if it is so vain and hopeless to find one for ourselves? 
I know that certain crazy pedants have attempted to counter this difficulty by maintaining that education is not instruction at all, does not teach by authority at all. They present the process as coming, not from the outside, from the teacher, but entirely from inside the boy. Education, they say, is the Latin for leading out or drawing out the dormant faculties of each person. Somewhere far down in the dim boyish soul is a primordial yearning to learn Greek accents or to wear clean collars, and the schoolmaster only gently and tenderly liberates this imprisoned purpose. Sealed up in the newborn babe are the intrinsic secrets of how to eat asparagus and what was the date of Bannockburn. The educator only draws out the child's own unapparent love of long division only leads out the child's slightly veiled preference for milk pudding to tarts. I am not sure that I believe in the derivation. I have heard the disgraceful suggestion that educator, if implied to Roman schoolmaster, did not mean leading our young functions into freedom, but only meant taking out little boys for a walk. But I am much more certain that I do not agree with the doctrine. I think it would be about as sane to say that the baby's milk comes from the baby, as to say that the baby's educational merits do. There is indeed, in each living creature, a collection of forces and functions, but education means producing these in particular shapes and training them to particular purposes, or it means nothing at all. Speaking is the most practical instance of the whole situation. You may indeed draw out squeals and grunts from the child by simply poking him and pulling him about, a pleasant but cruel pastime to which many psychologists are addicted. But you will wait and watch, very patiently indeed, before you draw the English language out of him. That you have got to put into him, and there is an end of the matter. End of an Evil Cry Recording by Breathe Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Authority the Unavoidable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What's Wrong with the World by G.K. Chesterton Part 4 Education or the Mistake about the Child Chapter 6 Authority the Unavoidable But the important point here is only that you cannot anyhow get rid of authority in education. It is not so much, as poor conservatives say, that parental authority ought to be preserved as that it cannot be destroyed. Mr. Bernard Shaw once said that he hated the idea of forming a child's mind. In that case, Mr. Bernard Shaw had better hang himself, for he hates something inseparable from human life. I only mentioned educere and the drawing out of the faculties in order to point out that even this mental trick does not avoid the inevitable idea of parental or scholastic authority. The educator drawing out is just as arbitrary and coercive as the instructor pouring in, for he draws out what he chooses. He decides what in the child shall be developed and what shall not be developed. He does not, I suppose, draw out the neglected faculty of forgery. He does not, so far at least, lead out with timid steps a shy talent for torture. The only result of all this pompous and precise distinction between the educator and the instructor is that the instructor pokes where he likes and the educator pulls where he likes. Exactly the same intellectual violence is done to the creature who is poked and pulled. Now we must all accept the responsibility of this intellectual violence. Education is violent because it is creative. It is creative because it is human. It is as reckless as playing on the fiddle, as dogmatic as drawing a picture, as brutal as building a house. 
In short, it is what all human action is. It is an interference with life and growth. After that, it is a trifling, and even a jocular question whether we say of this tremendous tormentor, the artist man, that he puts things into us like an apothecary, or draws things out of us like a dentist. The point is that man does what he likes. He claims the right to take his mother nature under his control. He claims the right to make his child the superman in his image. Once flinched from this creative authority of man and the whole courageous raid, which we call civilization, wavers and falls to pieces. Now, most modern freedom is at root fear. It is not so much that we are too bold to endure rules, it is rather that we are too timid to endure responsibilities. And Mr. Shaw and such people are especially shrinking from that awful and ancestral responsibility to which our fathers committed us when they took the wild step of becoming men. I mean the responsibility of affirming the truth of our human tradition and handing it on with a voice of authority, an unshaken voice. That is the one eternal education, to be sure enough that something is true that you dare to tell it to a child. From this high audacious duty, the moderns are fleeing on every side. And the only excuse for them is, of course, that their modern philosophies are so half-baked and hypothetical that they cannot convince themselves enough to convince even a newborn babe. This, of course, is connected with the decay of democracy and is somewhat of a separate subject. Suffice it to say here that when I say that we should instruct our children, I mean that we should do it, not that Mr. Sully or Professor Earl Barnes should do it. The trouble in too many of our modern schools is that the state, being controlled so specially by the few, allows cranks and experiments to go straight to the schoolroom when they have never passed through the parliament, the public house, the private house, the church, or the marketplace. Obviously, it ought to be the oldest things that are taught to the youngest people, the assured and experienced truth that are put first to the baby. But in a school today, the baby has to submit to a system that is younger than himself. The flopping infant of four actually has more experience and has weathered the world longer than the dogma to which he is made to submit. Many a school boasts of having the last ideas in education, when it has not even the first idea. For the first idea is that even innocence, divine as it is, may learn something from experience. But this, as I say, is all due to the mere fact that we are managed by a little oligarchy. My system presupposes that men who govern themselves will govern their children. Today, we all use popular education as meaning education of the people. I wish I could use it as meaning education by the people. The urgent point at present is that these expansive educators do not avoid the violence of authority an inch more than the old school masters. Nay, it might be maintained that they even avoid it less. The old village schoolmaster beat a boy for not learning grammar and sent him out into the playground to play anything he liked, or at nothing, if he liked that better. The modern scientific schoolmaster pursues him into the playground and makes him play at cricket, because exercise is so good for the health. The modern Dr. Busby is a doctor of medicine as well as a doctor of divinity. He may say that the good of exercise is self-evident, but he must say it, and say it with authority cannot really be self-evident, or it never could have been compulsory. But this is, in modern practice, a very mild case. In modern practice, the free educationists forbid far more things than the old-fashioned educationists. A person with a taste for paradox, if any such shameless creature should exist, might with some plausibility maintain concerning all our expansion since the failure of Luther's Frank. paganism and its replacement by Calvin's Puritanism, that all this expansion has not been an expansion, but the closing in of a prison, so that less and less beautiful and humane things have been permitted. 
the Puritans destroyed images, the rationalists forbade fairy tales. Count Tolstoy practically issued one of his papal encyclicals against music, and I have heard of modern educationists who forbid children to play with tin soldiers. I remember a meek little madman who came up to me at some socialist soiree or other and asked me to use my influence, have I any influence, against adventure stories for boys. It seems they breed an appetite for blood. But never mind that. One must keep one's temper in this madhouse. I need only insist here that these things, even if a just deprivation, are a deprivation. I do not deny that the old vetoes and punishments were often idiotic and cruel, though they are much more so in a country like England, where in practice only a rich man decrees the punishment and only a poor man receives it, than in countries with a clearer popular tradition, such as Russia. In Russia, flogging is often inflicted by peasants on a peasant. In modern England, flogging can only in practice be inflicted by a gentleman on a very poor man. Thus, only a few days ago, as I write, a small boy, a son of the poor, of course, was sentenced to flogging an imprisonment for five years for having picked up a small piece of coal which the experts value at five pence. I am entirely on the side of such liberals and humanitarians as have protested against this almost bestial ignorance about boys, but I do think it a little unfair that these humanitarians, who excuse boys for being robbers, should denounce them for playing at robbers. I do think that those who understand a gutter snipe playing with a piece of coal might, by a sudden spurt of imagination, understand him playing with a tin soldier. To sum it up in one sentence, I think my meek little madman might have understood that there is many a boy who would rather be flogged, and unjustly flogged, than have his adventure story taken away. End of Authority, the Unavoidable, recorded by Craig Campbell in Appleton, Wisconsin, in 2009. The Humility of Mrs. Grundy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vaughn Ullman. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton. Part 3, Chapter 7, The Humility of Mrs. Grundy. In short, the new education is as harsh as the old, whether or no it is as high. The freest fad, as much as the strictest formula, is stiff with authority. It is because the humane father thinks soldiers wrong that they are forbidden. There is no pretense, there can be no pretense, that the boy would think so. The average boy's impression would certainly be simply this. If your father is a Methodist, you must not play with soldiers on Sunday. If your father is a Socialist, you must not play with them even on weekdays. All educationists are utterly dogmatic and authoritarian. You cannot have free education. For if you left a child free, you would not educate him at all. Is there then no distinction or difference between the most hidebound conventionalists and the most brilliant and bizarre innovators? Is there no difference between the heaviest heavy father and the most reckless and speculative maiden aunt? Yes, there is. The difference is that the heavy father, in his heavy way, is a democrat. He does not urge a thing merely because to his fancy it should be done, but because, in his own admirable Republican formula, everybody does it. The conventional authority does claim some popular mandate. The unconventional authority does not. The Puritan, who forbids soldiers on Sunday, is at least expressing a Puritan opinion, not merely his own opinion. He is not a despot, he is a democracy, a tyrannical democracy, a dingy and local democracy, perhaps, but one that could do and has done the two ultimate viral th virile things, fight and appeal to God. 
but the veto of the new educationist is like the veto of the House of Lords. It does not pretend to be representative. These innovators are always talking about the blushing modesty of Mrs. Grundy. I do not know whether Mrs. Grundy is more modest than they are, but I am sure she is more humble. But there is a further complication. The most anarchic modern may again attempt to escape the dilemma by saying that education should only be an enlargement of the mind, an opening of all the organs of receptivity. Light, he says, should be brought into darkness. Blinded and thwarted existences in all our ugly corners should merely be permitted to perceive and expand. In short, enlightenment should be shed over darkest London. Now here is just the trouble, that, in so far as this is involved, there is no darkest London. London is not dark at all, not even at night. We have said that if education is a solid substance, then there is none of it. We may now say that if education is an abstract expansion, there is no lack of it. There is far too much of it. In fact, there is nothing else. There are no uneducated people. Everybody in England is educated. Only most people are educated wrong. The state schools were not the first schools, but among the last schools to be established. And London had been educating Londoners long before the London School Board. The error is a highly practical one. It is persistently assumed that unless a child is civilized by the established schools, he must remain a barbarian. I wish he did. Every child in London becomes a highly civilized person. But here are so many different civilizations, most of them born and tired. Anyone will tell you that the trouble with the poor is not so much that the old are still foolish, but rather that the young are already wise without going to school at all. The gutter boy would be educated. Without going to school at all, he would be over-educated. The real object of our schools should be not so much to suggest complexity as solely to restore simplicity. You will hear venerable idealists declare we must make war on the ignorance of the poor. But, indeed, we have rather to make war on their knowledge. Real educationists have to resist a kind of roaring cataract of culture. The truant is being taught all day. If the children do not look at the large letters in the spelling book, they need only walk outside and look at the large letters on the poster. If they do not care for the colored maps provided by the school, they can gape at the colored maps provided by the Daily Mail. If they tire of electricity, they can take to electric trams. If they are unmoved by music, they can take to drink. If they will not work so as to get a prize from their school, they may work to get a prize from prizy bits. If they cannot learn enough about law and citizenship to please the teacher, they learn enough about them to avoid the policeman. If they will not learn history forwards from the right end in the history books, they will learn it backwards from the wrong end in the party newspapers. And this is the tragedy of the whole affair, that the London poor, a particularly quick-witted and civilized class, learn everything tail foremost, learn even what is right in the way of what is wrong. They do not see the first principles of law in a logbook. They only see its last results in the police news. They do not see the truths of politics in a general survey. They only see the lies of politics at a general election. But whatever be the pathos of the London poor, it has nothing to do with being uneducated. So far from being without guidance, they are guided constantly, earnestly, excitedly, only guided wrong. The people are not at all neglected. They are merely oppressed. Nay, rather, they are persecuted. There are no people in London who are not appealed to by the rich. The appeals of the rich shriek from every hoarding and shout from every hustings. For it should always be remembered that the queer abrupt ugliness of our streets and costumes are not the creation of democracy but of aristocracy. The House of Lords objected to the embankment being disfigured by trams, but most of the rich men who disfigure the street walls with their wares are actually in the House of Lords. The peers make the country seats beautiful by making the town streets hideous. This, however, is parenthetical. The point is that the poor in London are not left alone, but rather deafened and bewildered with raucous and despotic advice. They are not like sheep without a shepherd. They are more like one sheep whom twenty-seven shepherds are shouting at. All the newspapers, all the new advertisements, all the new medicines and new theologies, all the glare and blare of the gas and brass of modern times, it is against these that the national school must bear up if it can. I will not question that our elementary education is better than barbaric ignorance, but there is no barbaric ignorance. 
I do not doubt that our schools would be good for uninstructed boys, but there are no uninstructed boys. A modern London school ought not merely to be clearer, kindlier, more clever, and more rapid than ignorance and darkness. It must also be clearer than a picture postcard, cleverer than a limerick competition, quicker than the tram, and kindlier than the tavern. The school, in fact, has the responsibility of universal rivalry. We need not deny that. Everywhere there is a light that must conquer darkness. But here we demand a light that can conquer light. End of the Humility of Mrs. Grundy Recording by Vaughn Ullman V-O-N-S-T-A-K-E-S dot blogspot dot com and rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org what's wrong with the world by g k chesterton part 4 chapter 8 the broken rainbow I will take one case that will serve both as symbol and example. The case of color. We hear the realists, those sentimental fellows, talking about the gray streets and the gray lives of the poor. But whatever the poor streets are, they are not gray, but motley, striped, spotted, piebald, and patched like a quilt. Hoxton is not aesthetic enough to be monochrome, and there is nothing of the Celtic twilight about it. As a matter of fact, a London gutter boy walks unscathed among furnaces of colour. Watch him walk along a line of hoardings, and you will see him now against glowing green like a traveller in a tropic forest, now black like a bird against the burning blue of the midi now passant across a field ghouls, like the golden leopards of England. He ought to understand the irrational rapture of that cry of Mr. Stephen Phillips about that bluer blue, that greener green. There is no blue much bluer than Reckitt's blue, and no blacking blacker than Dan Martin's, no more emphatic yellow than that of Coleman's mustard. If, despite this chaos of colour, like a shattered rainbow, the spirit of the small boy is not exactly intoxicated with art and culture, the cause certainly does not lie in universal greyness or the mere starving of his senses. It lies in the fact that the colours are presented in the wrong connection, on the wrong scale and above all from the wrong motive it is not colors he lacks but a philosophy of colors in short there is nothing wrong with reckitt's blue except that it is not reckitt's blue does not belong to reckitt but to the sky black does not belong to day and martin but to the abyss even the finest posters are only very little things on a very large scale. There is something specially irritant in this way about the iteration of advertisements of mustard, a condiment, a small luxury, a thing in its nature not to be taken in quantity. There is a special irony in these starving streets to see such a great deal of mustard to such very little meat. Yellow is a bright pigment, mustard is a pungent pleasure. But to look at these seas of yellow is to be like a man who should swallow gallons of mustard. He would either die or lose the taste of mustard altogether. Now, Suppose we compare these gigantic trivialities 
on the hoardings with those tiny and tremendous pictures in which the medievals recorded their dreams little pictures where the blue sky is hardly longer than a single sapphire and the fires of judgment only a pygmy patch of gold the difference here is not merely that poster art is in its nature more hasty than illumination art it is not even merely that the ancient artist was serving the lord while the modern artist is serving the lords it is that the old artist contrived to convey an impression that colors really were significant and precious things like jewels and talismanic stones the color was often arbitrary but it was always authoritative if a bird was blue if a tree was golden if a fish was silver if a cloud was scarlet the artist managed to convey that these colors were important and almost painfully intense all the red red hot and all the gold tried in the fire now that is the spirit touching color which the schools must recover and protect if they are really to give the children any imaginative appetite or pleasure in the thing it is not so much an indulgence in color it is rather if anything a sort of fiery thrift it fenced in a green field in heraldry as straightly as a green field in peasant proprietorship it would not fling away gold leaf any more than gold coin it would not heedlessly pour out purple or crimson any more than it would spill good wine or shed blameless blood that is the hard task before educationists in this special matter they have to teach people to relish colors like liquors they have the heavy business of turning drunkards into wine tasters if even the 20th century succeeds in doing these things it will almost catch up with the 12th the principle covers however the whole of modern life morris and the merely aesthetic medievalists always indicated that a crowd in the time of chaucer would have been brightly clad and glittering compared with a crowd in the time of queen victoria i am not so sure that the real distinction is here there would be brown frocks of friars in the first scene as well as brown bowlers of clerks in the second there would be purple plumes of factory girls in the second scene as well as purple lenten vestments in the first there would be white waistcoats against white ermine gold watch chains against gold lions the real difference is here that the brown earth color of the monk's coat was instinctively chosen to express labor and humility whereas the brown color of the clerk's hat was not chosen to express anything the monk did mean to say that he robed himself in dust i am sure the clerk does not mean to say that he crowns himself with clay he is not putting dust on his head as the only diadem of man purple at once rich and somber does suggest a triumph temporarily eclipsed by a tragedy but the factory girl does not intend her hat to express a triumph temporarily eclipsed by a tragedy far from it white ermine was meant to express moral purity white waistcoats were not gold lions do suggest a flaming magnanimity gold watch chains do not the point is not that we have lost the material hues but that we have lost the trick of turning them to the best advantage we are not like children who have lost their paint box and are left alone with a gray lead pencil we are like children who have mixed all the colors in the paint box together and lost the paper of instructions even then 
I do not deny one has some fun. Now, this abundance of colors and the loss of a color scheme is a pretty perfect parable of all that is wrong with our modern ideals and especially with our modern education. It is the same with ethical education, economic education, every sort of education. The growing London child will find no lack of highly controversial teachers who will teach him that geography means painting the map red, that economics means taxing the foreigner, that patriotism means the peculiarly un-English habit of flying a flag on Empire Day. In mentioning these examples specially, I do not mean to imply that there are no similar crudities and popular fallacies upon the other political side. I mention them because they constitute a very special and arresting feature of the situation. I mean this, that there were always radical revolutionists. But now there are Tory revolutionists also. The modern conservative no longer conserves. He is avowedly an innovator, does all the current defences of the House of Lords, which describe it as a bulwark against the mob, are intellectually done for. The bottom has fallen out of them, because on five or six of the most turbulent topics of the day, the House of the Lords is a mob itself, and exceedingly likely to behave like one. End of The Broken Rainbow The Need for Narrowness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vaughn Ullman. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton. Part 3. Chapter 7. The Need for Narrowness. Through all this chaos, then, we come back once more to our main conclusion. The true task of culture today is not a task of expansion but very decidedly of selection and rejection. The educationist must find a creed and teach it. Even if it be not a theological creed, it must still be as fastidious and as firm as theology. In short, it must be orthodox. The teacher may think it antiquated to have decided precisely between the faith of Calvin and of Laud, the faith of Aquinas of Swedenborg, but he still has to choose between the faith of Kipling and of Shaw, between the world of Blatchford and of General Booth. Call it, if you will, a narrow question whether your child should be brought up by the vicar or the minister or the popish priest. You have still to face that larger, more liberal, more highly civilized question of whether he shall be brought up by Harmsworth or by Pearson or by Mr. Eustace Miles with his simple life, or Mr. Peter Keary with his strenuous life, whether he shall most eagerly read Miss Annie S. Swan or Mr. Bart Kennedy. In short, whether he shall end up in the mere violence of the SDF or in the mere vulgarity of the Primrose League. They say that nowadays the creeds are crumbling. I doubt it. But at least the sects are increasing, and education must now be a sectarian education, merely for practical purposes. Out of all this throng of theories, it must somehow select a theory. Out of all these thundering voices, it must manage to hear a voice. Out of all this awful and aching battle of blinding lights, without one shadow to give shape to them, it must manage somehow to trace and track a star. I have spoken so far of popular education, which began too vague and vast, and which therefore has accomplished little. But as it happens, there is in England something to compare it with. There is an institution, or class of institutions, which began with the same popular object, which has since followed a much narrower object, but which had the great advantage that it did follow some object, unlike our modern elementary schools. In all these problems I should urge the solution which is positive, or, as silly people say, optimistic. I should set my face, that is, 
against most of the solutions that are solely negative and abolitionist. Most educators of the poor seem to think that they have to teach the poor man not to drink. I should be quite content if they teach him to drink, for it is mere ignorance about how to drink and when to drink that is accountable for most of his tragedies. I do not propose, like some of my revolutionary friends, that we should abolish the public schools. I propose the much more lurid and desperate experiment that we should make them public. I do not wish to make Parliament stop working, but rather to make it work, not to shut up churches, but rather to open them, not to put out the lamp of learning or destroy the hedge of property, but only to make some rude effort to make universities fairly universal and property decently proper. In many cases, let it be remembered, such action is not merely going back to the old ideal, but is even going back to the old reality. It would be a great step forward for the gin shop to go back to the inn. It is incontrovertible true that to medievalize the public schools would be to democratize the public schools. Parliament did once really mean, as its name seems to imply, a place where people were allowed to talk. It is only lately that the general increase of efficiency, that is, of the speaker, has made it mostly a place where people are prevented from talking. The poor do not go to the modern church, but they went to the ancient church all right, and if the common man in the past had a grave respect for property, it may conceivably have been because he sometimes had some of his own. I therefore can claim that I have no vulgar itch of innovation in anything I say about any of these institutions. Certainly I have none in that particular one which I am now obliged to pick out of the list, a type of institution to which I have genuine and personal reasons for being friendly and grateful. I mean the great Tudor foundations, the public schools of England. They have been praised for a great many things, mostly, I am sorry to say, praised by themselves and their children. And yet, for some reason, no one has ever praised them the one really convincing reason. End of the Need for Narrowness Recording by Von Ullman V-O-N-S-T-A-K-E-S dot blogspot dot com The Case for the Public Schools This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton Part 4 Chapter 10 The Case for the Public Schools the word success can, of course, be used in two senses. It may be used with reference to a thing serving its immediate and peculiar purpose, as of a wheel going around, or it can be used with reference to a thing adding to the general welfare, as of a wheel being a useful discovery. It is one thing to say that Smith's flying machine is a failure, and quite another to say that Smith has failed to make a flying machine. Now, this is very broadly the difference between the old English public schools and the new democratic schools. Perhaps the old public schools are, as I personally think they are, ultimately weakening the country rather than strengthening it, and are therefore in that ultimate sense inefficient. But there is such a thing as being efficiently inefficient. You can make your flying ship so that it flies, even if you also make it so that it kills you. Now, the public school system may not work satisfactorily, but it works. The public schools may not achieve what we want, but they achieve what they want. The popular elementary schools do not in that sense achieve anything at all. It is very difficult to point to any gutter snipe in the street and say that he embodies the ideal for which popular education has been working. In the sense that the fresh-faced foolish boy in Athens does embody the ideal for which the headmasters of Harrow and Winchester have been working. 
the aristocratic educationists have the positive purpose of turning out gentlemen and they do turn out gentlemen even when they expel them the popular educationists would say that they had the far nobler idea of turning out citizens i concede that it is a much nobler idea but where are the citizens i know that the boy in athens is stiff with a rather silly and sentimental stoicism called being a man of the world i do not fancy that the errant boy is rigid with that republican stoicism that is called being a citizen the schoolboy will readily say with fresh and innocent hauteur i am an english gentleman i cannot so easily picture the errant boy drawing up his head to the stars and answering romanus service some let it be granted that our elementary teachers are teaching the very broadest code of morals while our great headmasters are teaching only the narrowest code of manners let it be granted that both these things are being taught but only one of them is being learned it is always said that great reformers or masters of events can manage to bring about specific and practical reforms but that they never fulfill their visions or satisfy their souls i believe there is a real sense in which this apparent platitude is quite untrue by a strange inversion the political idealist often does not get what he asks for but does get what he wants the silent pressure of his ideal lasts much longer and reshapes the world much more than the actualities by which he attempted to suggest it what perishes is the letter which he thought so practical what endures is the spirit which he felt to be unattainable and even unutterable it is exactly his schemes that are not fulfilled it is exactly his vision that is fulfilled does the 10 or 12 paper constitutions of the french revolution which seemed so business like to the farmers of them seem to us to have flown away on the wind as the wildest fancies what has not flown away what is a fixed fact in europe is the ideal and vision the republic the idea of a land full of mere citizens all with some minimum of manners and minimum of wealth the vision of the 18th century the reality of the 20th so i think it will generally be with the creator of social things desirable or undesirable all his schemes will fail all his tools break in his hands his compromises will collapse his concessions will be useless he must brace himself to bear his fate he shall have nothing but his heart's desire now if one may compare very small things with very great one may say that the english aristocratic schools can claim something of the same sort of success and solid splendor as the french democratic politics at least they can claim the same sort of superiority over the distracted and fumbling attempts of modern england to establish democratic education such success as has attended the public school boy throughout the empire a success exaggerated indeed by himself but still positive and a fact of a certain indisputable shape and size has been due to the central and supreme circumstance that the managers of our public schools did know what sort of boy they liked they wanted something and they got something instead of going to work in the broad minded manner and wanting everything and getting nothing the only thing in question is the quality of the thing they got there is something highly maddening in the circumstance that when 
modern people attack an institution that really does demand reform they always attack it for the wrong reasons thus many opponents of our public schools imagining themselves to be very democratic have exhausted themselves in an unmeaning attack upon the study of greek i can understand how greek may be regarded as useless especially by those thirsting to throw themselves into the cut-throat commerce which is the negation of citizenship but i do not understand how it can be considered undemocratic i quite understand why mr carnage has a hatred of greek it is obscurely founded on the firm and sound impression that in any self-governing greek city he would have been killed but i cannot comprehend why any chance democrat say mr quelch or mr will crooks i or mr john m robertson should be opposed to people learning the greek alphabet which was the alphabet of liberty why should radicals dislike greek in that language is written all the earliest and heaven knows the most heroic history of the radical party why should greek disgust a democrat when the very word democrat is greek a similar mistake though a less serious one is merely attacking the athletics of public schools as something promoting animalism and brutality now brutality in the only immoral sense is not a vice of the english public schools there is much moral bullying owing to the general lack of moral courage in a public school atmosphere these schools do upon the whole encourage physical courage but they do not merely discourage moral courage they forbid it the ultimate result of the thing is seen in the egregious english officer who cannot even endure to wear a bright uniform except when it is blurred and hidden in the smoke of battle this like all the affectations of our present plutocracy is an entirely modern thing it was unknown to the old aristocrats the black prince would certainly have asked that any knight who had the courage to lift his crest among his enemies should also have the courage to lift it among his friends as regards moral courage then it is not so much that the public schools support it feebly as that they suppress it firmly but physical courage they do on the whole support and physical courage is a magnificent fundamental the one great wise englishman of the eighteenth century said truly that if a man lost that virtue he could never be sure of keeping any other now it is one of the mean and morbid modern lies that physical courage is connected with cruelty the tolstoyan and kiplingite are nowhere more at one than in maintaining this they have i believe some small sectarian quarrel with each other the one saying that courage must be abandoned because it is connected with cruelty and the other maintaining that cruelty is charming because it is part of courage but it is all thank god a lie an energy and boldness of body may make a man stupid or reckless or dull or drunk or hungry but it does not make him spiteful and we may admit heartily without joining in that perpetual praise which public school men are always pouring upon themselves that this does operate to the removal of evil cruelty in the public schools english public school life is extremely like english public life for which it is the preparatory school it is like it specially in this that things are either very open common and conventional or else are very secret indeed now there is cruelty in public schools just as there is kleptomania and secret drinking 
and vices without a name. But these things do not flourish in the full daylight and common consciousness of the school, and no more does cruelty. A tiny trio of sullen-looking boys gather in corners and seem to have some ugly business always. It may be indecent literature, it may be the beginning of drunk, it may occasionally be cruel to little boys, but on this stage the bully is not a baggard. The proverb says that bullies are always cowardly, but these bullies are more than cowardly, they are shy. As a third instance of the wrong form of revolt against the public schools, I may mention the habit of using the word aristocracy with a double implication. To put the plain truth as briefly as possible, if aristocracy means rule by a rich king, England has aristocracy and the English public schools support it. If it means rule by ancient families of lawless blood, England has not God aristocracy and the public schools systematically destroy it. In these circles, real aristocracy, like real democracy, has become bad form. A modern fashionable host dare not praise his ancestry. It would so often be an insult to half the other oligarchs at table who have no ancestry. We have said he has not the moral courage to wear his uniform. Still less has he the moral courage to wear his coat of arms. The whole thing now is only a vague hodgepodge of nice and nasty gentlemen. The nice gentleman never refers to anyone else's father. The nasty gentleman never refers to his own. That is the only difference. The rest is the public school manner. But Etten and Harrow have to be aristocratic because they consist so largely of parvenues. The public school is not a sort of refuge for aristocrats like an asylum, a place where they go in and never come out. It is a factory for aristocrats. They come out without ever having perceptibly gone in. The poor little private schools in their old world sentimental feudal style used to stick up a notice for the sons of gentlemen only. If the public schools stuck up a notice, it ought to be inscribed for the fathers of gentlemen only. In two generations, they can do the trick. End of the case for the public schools. The School for Hypocrites. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton. Part 4 Education or the Mistake about the Child. Chapter 11 The School for Hypocrites. These are the false accusations, the accusations of classicism, the accusation of cruelty, and the accusation of an exclusiveness based on perfection of pedigree. English public schoolboys are not pedants, they are not torturers, and they are not, in the vast majority of cases, people fiercely proud of their ancestry, or even people with any ancestry to be proud of. They are taught to be courteous, to be good-tempered, to be brave in a bodily sense, to be clean in a bodily sense. They are generally kind to animals, generally civil to servants, and to anyone in any sense their equal. The jolliest companions on earth. Is there then anything wrong in the public school ideal? I think we all feel there is something very wrong in it, but a blind network of newspaper phraseology obscures and entangles us so it is hard to trace to its beginning beyond all words and phrases the faults in this great english achievement surely when all is said the ultimate objection to the english public school is its utterly 
blatant and indecent disregard of the duty of telling the truth. I know there does still linger among maiden ladies in remote country houses a notion that English schoolboys are taught to tell the truth, but it cannot be maintained seriously for a moment. Very occasionally, very vaguely, English schoolboys are told not to tell lies, which is a totally different thing. I may silently support all the obscene fictions and forgeries in the universe without once telling a lie. I may wear another man's coat, steal another man's wit, apostatize to another man's creed, or poison another man's coffee, all without ever telling a lie. But no English schoolboy is ever taught to tell the truth for the very simple reason that he is never taught to desire the truth. From the very first, he is taught to be totally careless about whether a fact is a fact. He is taught to care only whether the fact can be used on his side when he is engaged in playing the game. He takes sides in his union debating society to settle whether Charles I ought to have been killed with the same solemn and pompous frivolity with which he takes sides in the cricket field to decide whether rugby or Westminster shall win. He is never allowed to admit the abstract notion of the truth, that the match is a matter of what may happen, but that Charles I is a matter of what did happen, or did not. He is liberal or Tory at the general election exactly as he is Oxford or Cambridge at the boat race. He knows what sport deals with the unknown. He has not even a notion that politics should deal with the known. If anyone really doubts this self-evident proposition that the public schools definitely discourage the love of truth, there is one fact which I should think would settle him. England is a country of the party system. It has always been chiefly run by public schoolmen. Is there anyone out of Hanwell who will maintain that the party system, whatever its conveniences or inconveniences, could have been created by people particularly fond of truth? The very English happiness on this point is itself a hypocrisy. When a man really tells the truth, the first truth he tells is that he himself is a liar. David said in his haste, that is, in his honesty, that all men are liars. It was afterwards, in some leisurely official explanation, that he said the kings of Israel at least told the truth. When Lord Curzon was viceroy, he delivered a moral lecture to the Indians on their reputed indifference to veracity, to actuality, and intellectual honor. A great many people indignantly discussed whether Orientals deserved to receive this rebuke, whether Indians were indeed in a position to receive such severe admonition. No one seemed to ask, as I should venture to ask, whether Lord Curzon was in a position to give it. He is an ordinary party politician. A party politician means a politician who might have belonged to either party. Being such a person, he must again and again, at every twist and turn of party strategy, either have deceived others or grossly deceived himself. I do not know the East, nor do I like what I know. I am quite ready to believe that when Lord Curzon went out he found a very false atmosphere. I only say it must have been something startlingly and chokingly false if it was falser than the English atmosphere from which he came. The English Parliament actually cares for everything except veracity. The public schoolman is kind, courageous, polite, clean, companionable, but in the most awful sense of the words, the truth is not in him. This weakness of untruthfulness in the English public schools, in the English political system, and to some extent in the English character, is a weakness which necessarily produces a curious crop of superstitions, of lying legends, of evident delusions clung to through low spiritual self-indulgence. There are so many of these public school superstitions that I have here only space for one of them, which may be called the superstition of soap. It appears to have been shared by the ablutionary Pharisees who resembled the English public school aristocrats in so many respects. 
in their care about club rules and traditions, in their offensive optimism at the expense of other people, and above all in their unimaginative plodding patriotism in the worst interests of their country. Now the old human sense about washing is that it is a great pleasure. Water, applied externally, is a splendid thing, like wine. Sybarites bathe in wine, and nonconformists drink water. But we are not concerned with these frantic exceptions. Washing being a pleasure, it stands to reason that rich people can afford it more than poor people, and as long as this was recognized, all was well, and it was very right that rich people should offer baths to poor people, as they might offer any other agreeable thing, a drink or a donkey ride. But one dreadful day, somewhere about the middle of the 19th century, somebody discovered, somebody pretty well off, the two great modern truths, that washing is a virtue in the rich, and therefore a duty in the poor. For a duty is a virtue that one can't do, and a virtue is generally a duty that one can do quite easily, like the bodily cleanliness of the upper classes. But in the public school tradition of public life, Soap has become creditable simply because it is pleasant. Baths are represented as a part of the decay of the Roman Empire, but the same baths are represented as part of the energy and rejuvenation of the British Empire. There are distinguished public schoolmen, bishops, dons, headmasters, and high politicians, who, in the course of the eulogies which from time to time they pass upon themselves, have actually identified physical cleanliness with moral purity. They say, if I remember rightly, that a public schoolman is clean inside and out, as if everyone did not know that while saints can afford to be dirty, seducers have to be clean, as if everyone did not know that the harlot must be clean, because it is her business to captivate, while the good wife may be dirty, because it is her business to clean as if we did not all know that whenever God's thunder cracks above us, it is very likely indeed to find the simplest man in a muckhart and the most complex blackguard in a bath. There are other instances, of course, of this oily trick of turning the pleasures of a gentleman into the virtues of an Anglo-Saxon. Sport, like soap, is an admirable thing. But, like soap, it is an agreeable thing and it does not sum up all mortal merits to be a sportsman playing the game in a world where it is so often necessary to be a workman doing the work. By all means, let a gentleman congratulate himself that he has not lost his natural love of pleasure, as against the blasé and unchildlike. But when one has the childlike joy, it is best to have also the childlike unconsciousness, and I do not think we should have special affection for the little boy who everlastingly explains that it was his duty to play hide-and-seek and one of his family virtues to be prominent in puss in the corner. Another such irritating hypocrisy is the oligarchic attitude towards mendacity as against organized charity. Here again, as in the case of cleanliness and of athletics, the attitude would be perfectly human and intelligible if it were not maintained as a merit. Just as the obvious thing about soap is that it is a convenience, so the obvious thing about beggars is that they are an inconvenience. The rich would deserve very little blame if they simply said that they never dealt directly with beggars, because in modern urban civilization it is impossible to deal directly with beggars, or if not impossible, at least very difficult. But these people do not refuse money to beggars on the ground that such charity is difficult. They refuse it on the grossly hypocritical ground that such charity is easy. They say, with the most grotesque gravity, anyone can put his hand in his pocket and give a poor man a penny. But we, philanthropists, go home and brood and travail over the poor man's troubles until we have discovered exactly what jail, reformatory, workhouse or lunatic asylum it will really be best for him to go to this is all sheer lying they do not brood about the man when they get home and if they did it would not alter the original fact that their motive for discouraging beggars 
is the perfectly rational one that beggars are a bother a man may easily be forgiven for not doing this or that incidental act of charity especially when the question is as genuinely difficult as is the case of mendacity but there is something quite pestilently pecksniffian about shrinking from a hard task on the plea that it is not hard enough if any man will really try talking to the ten beggars who come to his door he will soon find out whether it is really so much easier than the labor of writing a check for a hospital End of the school for hypocrites recorded by craig campbell in appleton wisconsin in 2009The Staleness of the New Schools. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanie. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton. Part 4. Chapter 12. The Staleness of the New Schools. For this deep and disabling reason, therefore, its cynical and abandoned indifference to the truth, the english public school does not provide us with the ideal that we require we can only ask its modern critics to remember that right or wrong the thing can be done the factory is working the wheels are going around the gentlemen are being produced with their soap cricket and organized charity all complete and in this as we have said before the public school really has an advantage over all the other educational schemes of our time you can pick out a public schoolman in any of the many companies into which they stray from a chinese opium den to a german jewish dinner party but i doubt if you could tell which little match girl had been brought up by undenominational religion and which by secular education this great english aristocracy which has ruled us since the reformation is really in this sense a model to the moderns it did have an ideal and therefore it has produced a reality we may repeat here that these pages propose mainly to show one thing that progress ought to be based on principle while our modern progress is mostly based on precedent we go not by what may be affirmed in theory but by what has already been admitted in practice that is why the jacobites are the last tories in history with whom a high-spirited person can have much sympathy they wanted a specific thing they were ready to go forward with it and so they were also ready to go back for it. But modern Tories have only the dullness of defending situations that they have not had the excitement of creating. Revolutionists make a reform. Conservatives only conserve the reform. They never reform the reform, which is often very much wanted. Just as the rivalry of armaments is only a sort of sulky plagiarism, so the rivalry of parties is only a sort of sulky inheritance. Men have votes, so women must soon have votes. Poor children are taught by force, so they must soon be fed by force. The police shut public houses by twelve o'clock, so soon they must shut them by eleven o'clock. Children stop at school till they are fourteen, so soon they will stop till they are forty. No gleam of reason, no momentary return to first principles, no abstract asking of any obvious question can interrupt this mad and monotonous gallop of mere progress by precedent. It is a good way to prevent real revolution. By this logic of events, the radical gets as much into a rut as the conservative. We meet one hoary old lunatic who says his grandfather told him to stand by one style. We meet another hoary old lunatic who says his grandfather told him only to walk along one lane. I say we may repeat here this primary part of the argument because we have just now come to the place where it is most startlingly and strongly shown. The final proof that our elementary schools have no definite ideal of their own is the fact that they so openly imitate the ideals of the public schools. In the elementary schools we have all the ethical prejudices and exaggerations of Eton and Harrow carefully copied for people to whom they do not even roughly apply. We have the same wildly disproportionate doctrine of the effect of physical cleanliness on moral character. Educators and educational politicians declare, amid warm cheers, that cleanliness is far more important than all the squabbles about moral and religious training. It would really seem that so long as a little boy washes his hands, it does not matter whether he is washing off his mother's jam or his brother's gore. We have the same grossly insincere pretense that sport always encourages a sense of honor, when we know that it often ruins it. 
Above all, we have the same great upper-class assumption that things are done best by large institutions handling large sums of money and ordering everybody about, and that trivial and impulsive charity is in some way contemptible. As Mr. Blatchford says, the world does not want piety but soap, and socialism. Piety is one of the popular virtues, whereas soap and socialism are two hobbies of the upper middle class. These healthy ideals, as they are called, which our politicians and schoolmasters have borrowed from the aristocratic schools and applied to the democratic, are by no means particularly appropriate to an impoverished democracy. A vague admiration for organized government and a vague distrust of individual aid cannot be made to fit in at all into the lives of people among whom kindness means lending a saucepan and honor means keeping out of the workhouse. It resolves itself either into discouraging that system of prompt and patchwork generosity which is a daily glory of the poor, or else into hazy advice to people who have no money not to give it recklessly away. Nor is the exaggerated glory of athletics defensible enough in dealing with the rich who, if they did not romp and race, would eat and drink unwholesomely, by any means so much to the point, when applied to people most of whom will take a great deal of exercise anyhow, with spade or hammer, pickaxe or saw. And for the third case, of washing, it is obvious that the same sort of rhetoric about corporeal daintiness, which is proper to an ornamental class, cannot, merely as it stands, be applicable to a dustman. A gentleman is expected to be substantially spotless all the time. But it is no more discreditable for a scavenger to be dirty than for a deep sea diver to be wet. A sweep is no more disgraced when he is covered with soot than Michelangelo when he is covered with clay, or Bayard when he is covered with blood. Nor have these extenders of the public school tradition done or suggested anything by way of a substitute for the present snobbish system, which makes cleanliness almost impossible to the poor. I mean the general ritual of linen and the wearing of the cast-off clothes of the rich. One man moves into another man's clothes as he moves into another man's house. No wonder that our educationists are not horrified at a man picking up the aristocrat's second-hand trousers, when they themselves have only taken up the aristocrat's second-hand ideas. End of the Staleness of the New Schools The Outlawed Parent this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton Part 4 Education, or the Mistake about the Child Chapter 13 The Outlawed Parent there is one thing at least of which there is never so much as a whisper inside the public schools, and that is the opinion of the people. The only persons who seem to have nothing to do with the education of the children are the parents. Yet the English poor have very definite traditions in many ways. They are hidden under embarrassment and irony and those psychologists who have disentangled them talk of them as very strange, barbaric, and secretive things. But, as a matter of fact, the traditions of the poor are mostly, simply, the traditions of humanity, a thing which many of us have not seen for some time. For instance, working men have a tradition that if one is talking about a vile thing, it is better to talk of it in coarse language, one is the less likely to be seduced into excusing it. But mankind had this tradition also. Until the Puritans and their children, the Ibsenites, started the opposite idea, that it does not matter what you say as long as you say it with long words and a long face. Or again, the educated classes have tabooed most jesting about personal appearance. But in doing this, they taboo not only the humor of the slums, but more than half the healthy literature of the world. They put polite nosebags on the noses of Punch and Bardolph, Stiggins and Cyrano de Bergerac. Again, the educated classes have adopted a hideous and heathen custom of considering death as too dreadful to talk about, 
and letting it remain a secret for each person like some private malformation the poor on the contrary make a great gossip and display about bereavement and they are right they have hold of a truth of psychology which is at the back of all the funeral customs of the children of men the way to lessen sorrow is to make a lot of it the way to endure a painful crisis is to insist very much that it is a crisis to permit people who must feel sad at least to feel important in this the poor are simply the priests of the universal civilization and in their stuffy feasts and solemn chattering there is the smell of the baked meats of hamlet and the dust and the echo of the funeral games of patroclus the things philanthropists barely excuse or do not excuse in the life of the laboring classes are simply the things we have to excuse in all the greatest monuments of man it may be that the laborer is as gross as shakespeare or as garrulous as homer that if he is religious he talks nearly as much about hell as dante that if he is worldly he talks nearly as much about drink as dickens nor is the poor man without historic support if he thinks less of that ceremonial washing which christ dismissed and rather more of that ceremonial drinking which christ specifically sanctified the only difference between the poor man of today and the saints and heroes of history is that which in all classes separates the common man who can feel things from the great man who can express them what he feels is merely the heritage of man now nobody expects of course that the cabmen and coal heavers can be complete instructors of their children any more than the squires and colonels and tea merchants are complete instructors of their children there must be an educational specialist in loco parentis but the master at harrow is in loco parentis the master in hoxton is rather contra parentum the vague politics of the squire the vaguer virtues of the colonel the soul and spiritual yearnings of a tea merchant are in veritable practice conveyed to the children of these people at the english public schools but i wish here to ask a very plain and emphatic question can any one alive even pretend to point out in any way in which these special virtues and traditions of the poor are reproduced in the education of the poor i do not wish the coster's irony to appeal as coarsely in the school as it does in the tap-room but does it appear at all is the child taught to sympathize at all with his father's admirable cheerfulness and slang i do not expect the pathetic eager pietas of the mother with her funeral clothes and funeral baked meats to be exactly imitated in the educational system but has it any influence at all on the educational system does any elementary schoolmaster accord it even an instant's consideration or respect i do not expect the schoolmaster to hate hospitals and c o s centers so much as the schoolboy's father but does he hate them at all does he sympathize in the least with the poor man's point of honor against official institutions is it not quite certain that the ordinary elementary schoolmaster will think it not merely natural but simply conscientious to eradicate all these rugged legends of a laborious people and on principle to preach soap and socialism against beer and liberty in the lower classes the schoolmaster does not work for the parent but against the parent modern education means handing down the customs of the minority and rooting out the customs of the majority instead of their christ-like charity their shakespearean laughter and their high homeric reverence for the dead the poor have imposed on them mere pedantic copies of the prejudices of the remote rich they must think a bathroom a necessity because to the lucky it is a luxury they must swing swedish clubs because their masters are afraid of english cudgels and they must get over their prejudice against being fed by the parish because aristocrats feel no shame about being fed by the nation End of the outlawed parent recorded by craig campbell in appleton wisconsin in two thousand and nine